up into the hundreds or thousands of dollars. And that warrants additional security measures beyond what you see normally. Last but not least, you're looking at securing the peripherals attached to CE. And you're looking at a much wider range of peripherals besides your printer, your mouse, and your keyboard. This can include things like your cellular telephone, tel cellular modem, an industrial tool, which on the manufacturing floor of an automobile company might be a mechanical arm capable of lifting a two-ton piece of metal or might be capable of welding metal together. Certainly not the kind of piece of equipment that you would want to come under the control of someone who's unauthorized or malicious. And you'll also be looking at the various types of other radios that exist on these kind of devices, including Bluetooth, infrared ports, et cetera, et cetera. The threats primarily fall into the same categories that we see on the traditional internet and traditional OSs. You have worms. Everything within CE points to the fact that worms can exist and can propagate within this environment. It's all theoretical at this point, but I can assure you that it, there's nothing stopping anyone from writing such an animal. Malicious groups are individuals. Now, this particular threat has been, I believe, underestimated for Windows CE for a long time. In particular, the Microsoft development team uh, had originally envisioned CE as being an operating system that would run in a closed environment. For example, on a particular embedded system that had no networking capability of its own, that might never interact with a given user, and certainly would never run anything along the lines of a web browser or email client. This caused the traditional or historical bias or historical way of thinking that security wasn't really something that needed to be put into the operating system. Of course, that's all changed in the last several years, and security is now very important. Malicious individuals, the same vulnerabilities that exist on Internet Explorer are now becoming increasingly applicable to the versions of Internet Explorer on CE. These types of individuals who understand these attacks and these methods of penetration are going to increasingly leverage their knowledge against CE, I believe, with increasing success. And this is a, an issue that's only going to become more prevalent. Viruses have been known to exist for so-called personal devices, especially the Palm OS. In the case of Symbian and in our talk, Windows CE, those are mostly theoretical at this point. However, it has been demonstrated that it's possible to write them. In addition, there are several concept viruses for Symbian. This is something that's only going to increase. Luckily, I don't see this becoming an enormous concern because antivirus vendors today support Windows CE and you're going to be able to solve this problem using traditional software. People traditionally haven't thought of spammers as a security threat. They think of it more as a nuisance. Of course, you realize when you're driving your car and you have your cell phone or your personal digital assistant in your pocket and it beeps and you pick it up and you look at it and it's an SMS message from someone in China uh, trying to sell you a, a package of 100 pieces of ramen noodle at uh, you know, $3 that he's going to ship to you. It's SMS spam that I'm talking about. And because it's a personal device you keep on your person that draws your attention, it can be dangerous if you're getting inundated with it while you're operating heavy equipment. It's estimated that cellular telephone use is the second leading cause of accidents in North America. I think I even heard one person say it's now the leading cause uh, besides drunk driving. And that's something very serious, especially if we're looking at the trends in spam for mobile devices following the trends in spam for tr the traditional internet which was when it started, you would get a couple a day, then you would see literally hundreds a day for some accounts. And of course, software has yet to evolve, people have yet to write software to control spam on these types of devices, and therefore as the threat increases, there's going to be a lag uh, between the threat model or the threat level and the protection level. I'll discuss two general areas of vulnerability for CE. We have the traditional vulnerabilities that we all know and we've all seen before, we all understand. I'll just run through them for review. On my next slide, I'll examine some of the unique new threats that affect CE that most of us probably haven't seen before and maybe we haven't even considered. Of course, you have your good old malformed packet attack. Things like in the good old days, UDP bomb, sending a packet with bad headers, a bad source address, source routing, et cetera, et cetera. All of these affect Windows CE. Windows CE, in fact, has a re-implemented TCP IP protocol stack that's based roughly on traditional Windows, uh, but is, is based actually roughly on the Windows 98 model, but is significantly different and has been rewritten in a number of places. Buffer overflows and format string attacks also affect CE. 
In fact, the demonstration exploit that I'll be doing later in this presentation is a sample buffer overflow. Resource consumption is a much bigger issue for CE than it is on traditional operating systems. That's because CE was designed from the ground up to run on small hardware. We're not talking about desktop machines that now have something like 256 megabyte of RAM, a 40 gig hard disk, and that's on the lower end. We're talking about a PDA that weighs a couple of ounces, might have 20 megabytes of memory, and that memory, by the way, that's not system memory, half of that is dedicated to the hard disk, and the other half might be what's used as main storage. In addition, there's a piece of read-only memory that stores the operating system, but the term read-only is a little bit uh, disingenuous because even the read-only memory can be overwritten, which I'll talk about later. The net net of the resource consumption issue is that it's much easier for attackers to create a denial of service event on these types of devices because frankly, there's a lot less resources to consume and CE is not, has not implemented as many controls as Windows XP in terms of controlling its usage of resources. And that's because their solution to the problem was rather than controlling what resources, putting limits on the usage of resources, they just simply didn't use many to begin with and they kind of relied on the developers to make sure that they implemented their applications correctly. Here's a quick piece of trivia. We all know that one way of doing resource consumption on traditional Unix and Windows systems is to start an infinite number of processes and load up the entire process table. There's something like 16,000 processes that could theoretically be running on a Unix kernel at any given time. Can anyone care to guess what the hard-coded process limit for Windows CE is? How many concurrent processes can run on a Windows CE installation? That's correct. There's 31, I believe it's 32 actually. But there's, the kernel doesn't take, I believe the kernel does not take up its own process slot. There are 32 process slots. And there's slot, you're right, because slot zero is the currently running process. And uh, that's it, that's hard coded into the kernel. There's not, you can't run any more. How hard do you think it would be to launch 30 some processes? I'm sure we all realize it's not that difficult. And that's just one example. There's a number of others in terms of per process resources and handles, et cetera, et cetera. You also have web application and browser attacks. Windows CE uh, in configurations such as the PDA and smartphone, which you'll see here, enables an a application similar to Internet Explorer, and in fact, it's based on Internet Explorer. Um, with the same functionality, you have the same types of security risks. This, these devices support things like ActiveX controls, JavaScript, VBScript, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll discuss a little bit later exactly what that means and how best to deal with it. You also have authentication spoofing and session hijacking. Now, this gets exacerbated due to the next bullet point, which is that Windows CE typically operates in a wireless environment. Of course, that makes session hijacking and authentication spoofing easier. But what makes it more difficult to control in the CE environment is CE's lack of native authentication at all. Uh, CE generally has no concept of a user credential within its operating system. There's one system password to access the device in general. And that's at the lowest level of the architecture, that's all that is really assumed. So spoofing that, once you have that one system password, basically you might as well have privileged access to the device due to the way the kernel is architected, et cetera. And what that means is it's just a lot less challenging to circumvent the authentication that is there, that is available, that kind of got tacked onto the architecture in a way that wasn't necessarily uh, the best way to do it from the get-go. Of course, you have also your traditional wireless attacks. Man in the middle through signal jamming or signal overriding. You also have interception. I'm sure all of us here have run an 802.11b sniffer at some point, downloaded NetStumbler, or I think there's a copy of Etherreal or you can even run a lot of traditional network sniffers with a laptop 802.11 card. The new vulnerabilities for CE are somewhat, some of them are fairly interesting and some of them are actually quite surprising. When I told you the read-only memory that stores the operating system on devices like this could actually be overwritten, but one of the requirements that Microsoft had when developing some of these newer CE deployments was the ability to remotely update the operating system. Traditionally, the operating system has always been written onto ROM memory. And the intention originally was you burned it, 
you put the chip in, you just walked away and nothing happened. If you wanted to update the actual OS, you had a service guy in belt and suspenders, he walks up to the device, opens it up, he takes a new chip out with a new OS burned into it, physically replaces it, and then walks along in his merry way. Of course, you can't have a consumer product that makes that kind of requirement. Instead, they switch to something called flash ROM. Flash ROM traditionally acts as read-only memory. However, when it's sent a special signal, it zeroes everything out and goes into a writable state where it can then be written once more. Now, you can flash these things several hundred times. You, you can essentially overwrite them again and again and again, and each time it will save the state. Unfortunately, that can be done in software, but it's still read-only memory. This enables attackers who know what they're doing and can circumvent certain cryptographic security mechanisms in CE to go ahead and overwrite the software that's in ROM and put a backdoor in CE that can, uh, for practical purposes, be very, very difficult both to detect and even if it's detected, it uh, be exceptionally difficult to remove. And uh, if it's done correctly, it can actually be easier to physically remove, physically destroy the device and to remove the back door. Reset attacks. CE devices typically have no system disk. They have no magnetic platter-based disk. It's all read-only read memory and random access memory. That random access memory, sometimes it's two different sections. Sometimes it's all just one big section. But it doubles as both the system storage and also the file storage. There are options both on software and hardware to actually reset this memory to zero. And not only are you rebooting the system at that point, but you are, in fact, essentially erasing the entire disk and setting the device to a, a manufacturer's default state. Unlike formatting the C drive, which would be the equivalent on a desktop, this, thing can, this process can happen in microseconds, and there's very little you can do to prevent it from happening. In fact, I know the a CTO of a security company in Atlanta, not myself, who had this happen to him on his CE device. He hadn't made a backup in about three weeks, and he had to essentially rebuild his device from scratch. It was a very unfortunate incident. This is, it doesn't sound necessarily like a traditional DOS attack because it isn't. For enterprise users who deploy CE to their employees, this can be a very serious issue because you say, what's the value of one day of our employee's time? If, he's, if that employee is relying on CE to do his job and suddenly his device just gets uh, lobotomized or totally zapped out, you know, how long is it going to take you to get that, a new device to him? How long is it going to take him to re-enter all the data he lost? He could have several days worth of work that just went out the window. That's why you really need to have backups with these kind of devices as often as possible. Beyond this, secure, CE, as I've said, lacks the majority of traditional security subsystems that we have come to rely on in traditional operating systems. I don't want to pick on CE in this case because most of the other personal device OSs such as Symbian from uh, Symbian in England, and also Palm OS lack these same features. But, so they're all guilty, but focusing on CE for the purposes of this presentation, uh, that what this means is that people who want to operate a device in a secure fashion and provide any type of internal security controls pretty much are, uh, they're starting from the Stone Age, so to speak. So it can be done. The issue is there aren't, the tools aren't available to do it. You have to roll your own. And any time you're going to roll your own and you have to, you don't necessarily, you're, you haven't worked with CE for a long time, and you don't necessarily know all the nooks and crannies, even if you're a smart guy and you know what you're doing, it's really likely that you're going to get something wrong somewhere along the line and that it's just, you're going to make a mistake. The kernel, privilege, the kernel privilege mode within CE is not nearly as well protected as in traditional Unix or Windows operating systems. This isn't entirely the fault of the CE development team. Uh, much of these lack of protections is designed as a performance improvement. And in addition, nobody ever considered the fact that uh, in embedded devices, when CE was originally being architected, that the kernel would want to protect itself against potentially untrusted code that was running in user space. I'll talk more about this later, but it's going to be a serious issue for anyone using CE in the future. As you do trend, the more you implement security, both on the perimeter outside the device and also inside the device as you try to start to run code that may or may not be trusted, whether that be an ActiveX control that you downloaded or a Java applet, what have you. It's just, 
there's a big security gap in that particular layer of protection that's going to have to be filled in. And due to the state that it's in today, it's going to take a while to do that. You also have personal area network vulnerabilities. In this case, specifically, I'm talking about Bluetooth and infrared file transmissions. There are a couple of other sample protocols or uh, experimental protocols that do this kind of stuff. But those are the two you most commonly see. And recent versions of CE support both those. I'll talk about that more later in the presentation. In addition, those of you who caught an earlier presentation this morning, uh, there was significant talk about GSM and GPRS vulnerabilities. See, this is my last uh, bullet point here, and that's telephony. SMS has been known to have format string buffer overflows in certain Java phones. We've looked at SMS security in CE. It seems pretty reasonable, but we haven't looked through all of it yet. And in the case of GPRS, there are just known issues with the protocol. That means you don't necessarily want to be using that if you're trying to run a secure deployment of CE. And this is only going to increase the people who have implemented these types of protocols, uh, like the early CE development team, had not been indoctrinated into an information security way of thinking. They didn't necessarily make decisions with security in mind. And although they're very smart people, uh, they've laid some groundwork that's probably going to have to be reworked at some point if consumers and customers are going to want to run security, run CE in a secure manner. Moving on to the next section, we'll do a quick overview of what different things CE is used for. In, per, in particular, a very popular use is for PDAs and cell phones. How many people here have a PDA? Okay, that's a lot. Actually, how many people run CE, Pocket PC on their PDA? Wow, two thirds. That's, that was our big theory at Mobile Secure, was that CE was gonna become the popular PDA operating system. I'm glad that we, we were on the money there. Smartphone is essentially the same thing as a PDA, except it's a part of a cell phone and it has a smaller screen. In addition, CE runs on things like home appliances. And at first blush, you would think, well, who cares about the security of my washer and dryer? You know, do I, does it really matter if my neighbor who doesn't like me uh, you know, is able to run uh, hot water on my washer when I have the, the colors in there and it bleeds my colors. It's not, you know, red and, and blue, etc. It doesn't seem like it's going to be a significant issue. But increasingly, these so-called smart appliances, you'll see a lot of commercials from General Electric for them, are becoming networked within the home. So they're being controlled by, say, your central PC. And you say, you know, I'm going to set a timer delay on my, uh, on my PC to run my washer in two hours. And I put the load in and I leave and I want it to be done. Or, you know, I'm gonna, and then my PC might also be connected to my lighting system and I'm on vacation. And that might control the lights to turn on and off at certain times of the day. Well, what if, you know, that happens over 802.11b? Or what if it happens over Bluetooth, which is less likely because Bluetooth doesn't have the, the bandwidth or the, air, the signal strength to get throughout an entire house? Well, what that means is that the security of your entire house is now running over this 802.11 network. And of course, any network security is only as strong as its weakest link. That right? quote was kind of made famous by an early security company called Secure Networks out of Calgary. And it's really true. What if someone breaks into your washer dryer, either through some ancillary Bluetooth network, or if you're, you're not using WEP, or you don't have an entirely secure um, 802.11 installation, then he uses that to, say, propagate throughout in your home PC, into your home security system. It could be very dangerous. In addition, you have CE on ultra-small servers. This is just a lot of different things you'd never think of. For example, measuring the temperature in a metropolitan area, such as Las Vegas. The weathermen want to know what temperature it is in a lot of different places. Rather than sending someone out there, they're now deploying small computer-based devices. CE is increasingly used in surveillance equipment. This is to control closed-circuit TV cameras and in addition, security officers are now carrying what's called Microsoft Smart Displays and also PDAs that have Microsoft uh, video displays put on them. And these run CE, and what this happens is it's a portable television screen that a, a guard can take with him anywhere in a particular building and link in over a wireless network and view the output of any particular camera. So if a guard is on duty and he's, in, he's away from his security desk, he can see who's at the front gate. Well, let's imagine if someone was able to circumvent that wireless network, break into a particular camera, or break into his display even worse, and show that the CEO was at the front door trying to ring the doorbell to get in. Not a very good thing. 
Security is obviously very important in that use. You're also looking at CE being deployed in car automobile systems. Looking at the specific security requirements, in this case we'll have two different example uses of CE, so-called personal devices or PDAs and smartphones, and later on we'll look at servers. In addition to the basic security requirements, which I'll discuss later, you need to pay special attention to any attached telephony hardware. Two main reasons for that. One is that your cell phone bill could be greatly enlarged if someone were to start calling Indonesia or wherever. Second, cellular telephones have microphones on them. It's a microphone that you carry with you on your person, probably at all times. You might even carry your microphone and put it on your bedstand when you start to go to sleep. You don't necessarily want a sophisticated attacker who understands how that firmware works to be able to access that cellular telephony software and do something like, besides making a phone call, turn on the microphone and create an MP3 recording of all the microphone's output. That's been done before on the desktop. It's a little bit more dangerous for CE. You're looking at Bluetooth-based devices as well. You want to make sure that Bluetooth is disabled if you don't need it. If you do need it, make sure that all your services have passwords. Very important, especially for Pocket PC 2002, that you disable infrared file transmission by default, or disable receiving of infrared files by default. Also, we're going to talk later about how best to synchronize your Pocket PC device or smartphone device with a particular desktop. I do recommend that you use network security software if possible for your Pocket PC or smartphone device. I will uh, openly admit I'm a little biased in that respect because my company uh, sells such software. In addition, especially because CE runs over a wireless network, you want to use VPNs whenever possible. In the case of servers, when CE is operating in this mode, it's typically running on a stationary piece of hardware and generally running a web server and potentially a back-end SQL server for CE 2.0. This particular version of CE is very different than what you're used to, and we'll go into what, uh, what the security ramifications for it are later. In this case, I'm beyond any bias, CE does not have the native security that is required for this type of a server deployment. You need something beyond what's provided by default. You should absolutely be running some kind of secure software on this kind of a device. This next section is the largest, and it discusses exactly how to go about building a secure version of CE using Microsoft Platform Builder. Platform Builder is what Microsoft will ship to an OEM customer for the purposes of deploying the operating system on their particular piece of hardware. So those of you who have a Compaq IPAC actually didn't receive that version of CE directly from Microsoft. Microsoft shipped it to Compaq, and Compaq went and customized it for their own particular piece of hardware and then packaged it directly onto their, their PDA. The same thing for Toshiba, Dell does it. It's every single customer, every single manufacturer who ships CE goes through this exact same process. And that creates a couple of differences. One, every version of CE from your Compaq to your Toshiba is slightly different. It's, had, it's been a, light, a little bit modified. Second, Microsoft has made the decision early on that the primary responsibility for security was in the hands of these OEM customers. And as I'll get into later, a lot of the OEM customers haven't necessarily risen to the challenge. So I'll begin, because of the size of the section, by going through the different components that we'll discuss. We have ActiveSync. It's the CE equivalent to the old Palm OS hot sync method. You have the internet browser on CE. There's Bluetooth and IRDA protocols. You have the Windows CE notion of the trusted environment. And I'll talk to you about that and tell you whether or not you should trust it. You have, obviously, the TCP IKB component of Windows CE. CE supports the notion of file systems, and I'll get into what is, does, is and isn't provided uh, within that framework. There's the Microsoft Messaging Queue, and those of you who are familiar with that will know that it's a B2B financial transaction processing component, which is available for CE. Also, as I've discussed, a web server, internet information server, runs on CE and it does have some improved security beyond what's available, although not a lot. We'll also talk about SNMP and why you should never run it on CE or anywhere for security reasons. There's SQL Server, and amazingly enough, uh, FTP daemon and the Telnet daemon, uh, two insecure network servers that just refuse to die on the internet, they're also available on CE, and we'll look at those. 
in the case of ActiveSync. The purpose of ActiveSync is to synchronize between your PDA or smartphone and your desktop. And what it, you're going to synchronize things like your Microsoft Outlook contacts, synchronize certain applications, synchronize personal calendar entries, your schedule, et cetera, in some cases files. There's a lot of security risks with doing this active sync. In general, the only way you should, the only manner by which you should do it is in the manner in which I'm doing it, I'm syncing now, which is you have a PDA cradle such as this. It's connected by a USB link to your laptop or PC. You cradle the PDA and it will synchronize over that USB link. Now that's not a proprietary, it is a proprietary protocol, but it's not a proprietary network frame. It will actually operate, it creates a TCP IP link over that USB cable. And there it is. And there it goes and it's syncing. In the meantime, we'll finish the presentation. There are other ways you can do it, specifically over the internet. We recommend you don't do that for a number of reasons. One, there's no confidentiality of, of the data that's sent over ActiveSync. Two, if you're doing things correctly, you set the system password. The system password can be sniffed over the ActiveSync connection. And in addition, this ActiveSync connection is very powerful. It hooks directly into the CE operating system. And little did you know, just by plugging this thing in here and initiating a synchronization, any software running on this desktop computer here can access any piece of memory in CE or virtually any piece of, it can access any user land memory. It can do things like run processes, overwrite files, reset the device. Essentially, a, a process running on the desktop that's synchronized with this thing here might as well be running on the device itself. That's how close the connection is between these two things with this umbilical cord attached. Be very careful, the moral of the story there is be very careful what desktop you synchronize with. You go and synchronize with, uh, you know, your buddy who's a sales guy at another company, and little did you know, God knows what you downloaded. There's no notification, there's no way to prevent it. In addition, if you set your system password and someone gains physical access to your PDA or your smartphone, and he is able to cradle it and write his own custom software on his desktop, he can write a brute force attack that will attempt to churn out in electronically what your system password is. And that's why, frankly, we recommend you not rely on the traditional CE system password and instead use something that's improved, such as what's provided in some of the newer compact PDAs or and also provided uh, with security software such as MobileGuard. The internet browser, obviously, no operating system today would be complete without one. You have two, OEMs have two options. They can have what's called Pocket Internet Explorer, which is abbreviated PIE and generally pronounced PI. And in addition, you have your traditional Internet Explorer. Pi was designed to have less resource consumption and much less reduced footprint on the device itself. You also can do less. There's no concept of opening up new windows in Pi. Uh, support for JavaScript is much reduced. ActiveX controls are supported. But what we found in our research is that in reducing this, this functionality, Microsoft has greatly reduced the number of vulnerabilities uh, that Pi is affected by versus traditional IE. When you're seeing a lot of these, uh, George Ganinsky and other people posting IE bugs, bad ActiveX control here, JavaScript frame overflow there, Pi is generally not vulnerable to most of those. Not, it's not protected against all of them, whereas the traditional Internet Explorer for CE will generally be vulnerable. Luckily for you and I, just about every PDA here today, right, that's shipped today, runs Pi. And if you're building your own custom version of CE, that's why you should follow that tradition. In, the, in this case, there's two, besides JavaScript, there's something called Visual Basic Script. VB Script was something designed by Microsoft as an alternative to JavaScript. Very few servers outside of Microsoft-only solutions write code for this. We recommend that you remove it. You know, the only thing we see there is a potential for secure, additional security vulnerabilities. One of the trouble areas that we have seen are ActiveX controls on Windows CE. If you're rolling your own, we recommend you keep these to a minimum. There, there's a lot of danger here. In the case of Bluetooth and infrared, there's a lot of security concerns with these two protocols. And in addition, the CE component that both of them interface with, called OBEX, or which is an abbreviation for Object Exchange System, has some security concerns of its own. 
Generally, if you're sending a, an object via infrared or by certain Bluetooth services, there's no way to verify the security of, those, of that content. And in addition, in certain cases, uh, in the default case, you can overwrite certain files in certain areas of the system, which can lead to execution of code. In the case of infrared, there's no authentication whatsoever. Also, always turn it off. In the case of Bluetooth, if you really have to run it, you want to set very hard to guess passwords. Even in this case, uh, there's at stake just came out with a, I believe, a, a password brute forcer for uh, Bluetooth. I haven't had a chance to check it out yet. I don't know how good it is. The Windows CE trusted environment. Our take on this was that Microsoft had a requirement from several of its customers, or maybe one or a couple of its customers, to implement this. Essentially, if you all remember the old Authenticode security scheme for web controls, essentially it's a digital signature on a piece of code, and that digital signature would be signed by a particular organization, and based on what that signature was, the code may or may not be allowed to run. This is the same kind of framework that's implemented in CE and left to the OEM to build up as they see fit. And essentially it allows three modes of operation. If it's turned on, it verifies the digital signature. It may allow the code to not run at all. It may allow the code to run in what's called non-trusted mode. And it may allow the code to run in trusted mode. The difference being that our research has indicated that the difference between non-trusted mode and trusted mode is not, as, is not very significant. Uh, trusted mode allows the full access to all APIs on CE. Non-trusted mode has a, a significant restrictions on the number of system calls you can make, but our research has indicated that uh, that can still be bypassed anyway. User code can still gain access to kernel memory, and therefore all your kernel access restrictions and kernel controls go away at that point. If you're going to implement this, we strongly recommend that you do it in a way such that only code you build a very secure, very limited use operating system, only allow code that you have written and that you have signed is able to run, and anything else that is either not signed or signed by a third party, just don't run it at all. Now, that, in that one case, this type of a model can be made to work to a certain extent, but unfortunately, there's two deficiencies there. One, if there's old code that is still around and still signed, there's no way to, sum, to issue a revocation certificate. There's no way to invalidate vulnerable code that you've already created and already shipped. You can only ship new patches. There's no way of enforcing that everyone has actually implemented the upgrade. And in addition, the big one, you can't run any custom code on your PDA at this point or your, at your device, whatever it is. And for certain corporations, that's, a, that's easy to do. But for me personally, I want to be able to download uh, you know, the latest games and, you know, so I can play a game on the airplane rather than actually get any work done. Stuff like that. It's not, for consumer devices, this whole, this concept of the trusted environment is not going to fly. One, per, one example of kernel privilege escalation, in Pocket PC 3.0, not Pocket, in Windows CE 3.0 and uh, Windows CE 4.1, not 4.2, which is what uh, the smartphone in 2003 is based out of, there's a feature enabled called full kernel mode. And it's available in all of them, but it's only turned on in a certain subset. This was originally designed as a performance improvement for Windows CE. These guys thought, every time we have process switching between process, one process and another, we have to do a lot of virtual memory remapping to pull the one process's address space out of memory and put the other one in. And you know, you gotta control kernel memory and do a lot of stuff. What if we just ran everything in the one big virtual memory space. And in context switching, you know, everyone could access everyone else's memory, including the kernel, and that way we wouldn't have to worry about it. Well, it worked. CE runs a lot faster with this option enabled. You, you, especially when you start running five different processes and they're constantly switching between each other. Can anyone guess what the problem with this feature is? You overwrite the kernel. Ryan, you got it. It's, there's no, more, there's no more kernel protection. The kernel data is just, you know, use some pointer arithmetic in a process, and you just, you overwrite security controls, do whatever you want to do. This is not easily documented. It's turned on by default, and unfortunately, we've seen some cases where some significant OEM vendors have left it on. I'm not gonna say who. Please don't ask. Um, or ask me privately. 
in terms of securing TCP IP. Uh, it's very similar to securing this component in any other traditional operating system. The register keys are an HK local machine slash com slash interface uh, slash TCP IP PARMS. You have your usual suspects, things like IP routing. You want to look also do your big picture concerns such as what type of a network is this interface running over? Is it a wireless network? Do I need to encrypt it? Typically you do. In the case, you have two general families. You have the so-called point-to-point uh, cellular and GPRS PPP connections. Those you don't need as much encryption on. At this point in time, that's probably going to change. However, in terms of Wi-Fi or even wired Ethernet, a lot of these, in fact, you can get a compact flash card for something like this that has a, uh, a Cat5 cable connection. You want to run encryption to the maximum extent possible because just we all realize that sniffing is a real problem on those kinds of networks. In the case of file systems, every modern operating system has a file system. In the case of CE, because they decided there was no concept of user credentials, there was no concept of different levels of permission amongst different people using the device, they decided not to supply file system access controls. And it made a lot of sense at the time. You have to realize that this decision was made five, six years ago when CE was not being used for what it, what it does today. The problem is that a lot of people who write, who use CE today do need this functionality. Second off, it's hard to implement because to, to do file access controls, you need to actually have the concept of a user or a concept of a, an agent that is accessing the file upon which to base your authorization decision. We've had good experience at Mobile Secure on building custom file ACLs that use the accessing process as the acting agent. So we'll restrict access to files based on what processes are doing and create sometimes mini sandboxes for certain processes that we may not want to have access to other parts of the system, et cetera. In addition, because many of these devices are personal, they are handheld of a handheld nature, they can get lost, they can be physically retrieved by someone who you don't want to have, who you don't want to be having to view that data on there. You should consider encryption for your file storage. This type of functionality, ACLs and file store, is very easy to do on Windows CE 4.2 and 4.1. On 3.0, it's difficult, but it's still possible. Microsoft Messaging Queue. This is a business-to-business -business component within Windows CE. It's typically used for processing financial transactions. It doesn't necessarily, by default, link into any hardcore financial networks. It's simply just a framework. It's typically run on servers where there's a web server running and oftentimes a back-end SQL Server database. One thing to, one, the first thing you should do if you're running this is to disable the management ISAPI extension. Uh, it's the authentication provided is inadequate for the level of risk that you're introducing. And in addition, um, the, the, if you're using CE as a mobile point of sale terminal, could consider writing your own custom code or, or licensing something else besides MSMQ. And if you're doing it for something else that requires financial processing, ask yourself if you can use something else, such as a traditional desktop. Uh, we've looked at MSMQ. It's a big, hulking piece of software. And we do not believe that the security research community has had a chance to do an adequate look at how it works internally and make an adequate assessment of whether or not it is, in fact, secure. So it's probably best to wait until that uh, judgment is in. In the case of the good old-fashioned web server, uh, this is the slide I always take the most time on. Windows CE, the most security options that are added on by any Windows CE component come within IIS. Before you make the leap and decide to run a web server on a CE device, you should consider two things. The security controls and permissions that IIS provides is quote unquote, it's only skin deep. So from the concept of a browser, you will implement these security controls and it will control access to the content via that method. However, the underlying CE operating system doesn't inherit any of those. So there's still no file access permissions. There's still no concept of uh, process privilege, et cetera. In addition, 
most web servers today don't operate over an entirely wireless environment where you could walk up to the server itself and put a wireless sniffer and capture every single transaction that goes back and forth, right? You can typically go take a wireless sniffer and monitor clients that happen to be at a hotspot, but that's much different than being able to put, position your sniffer at the server itself. In CE, the opposite is true. In most cases, these types of servers are in wireless environments, and if you're not using encryption, you're just gonna be dead. You're gonna get hacked so fast it's not even funny. And because of that, you, because you can't generally use VPNs in a server environment, in some cases you can, but in most cases you don't want to, you want to require SSL for every single virtual directory that exists in this IIS implementation. IIS provides three levels of authentication. The first version of authentication is none, and that might be useful for some people, but if you're doing anything useful, you're probably going to want more than that. The next step up is HTTP basic authentication. We're all familiar with this, uh, we, even, though we don't, even if we don't recognize the name. Anyone who's ever visited a website, and they see that little dialog box pop up on their browser that says enter username and password. And sometimes it's, you know, like a, it's like demo and demo or some, you know, we've all seen it. The way that works, for those of you who don't know, you take your username, you put a semicolon, or I'm sorry, a colon, then your password. You do something called base64 encoding, which provides no security. It just makes the, the text look a little bit different. It sends that authentication credentials in part of the header of the HTTP request. The server then decodes those credentials, does a username and password check on them, and uses that as your credentials and either allows or denies you permission based on what those are. It's generally considered to be inadequate security even when implemented on the desktop. It's, we consider it inadequate on CE in part because of that, but also because there's several differences. One, because CE has no concept of so-called user credentials or user logins, when, with basic authentication, everyone is forced to have the same password, which is the root password to the system or the system password. So what this means, if I'm Jim and Bob over here also has an account, and I, our, that's our usernames, Jim and Bob, and I want to masquerade as Bob, it's a pretty simple process. I click my browser to the CE device, I, click in, I put in Bob, I put in my own password, and I'm logged in as Bob. What a lot of people who do this have, have now done is they're providing an easy to guess known password, and for authentication, they're providing hard to guess usernames. So now my username isn't Jim anymore, it's XYZ12578, or something along those lines. This will work to an extent, however, it's a little bit of a kludge, and it's not something that we recommend. It's just something that we throw out there if, uh, if someone finds that they need to do it and they don't have the resources to provide proper security. The third and final option for IIS is NT LAN Manager Authentication. And this is the only area within Windows CE that provides for the concept of a traditional user authentication with a unique username and a unique password that is different from the so-called global system password. In this case, you'll provide a name and a password. You'll have something called the redirector service, which will go and contact the domain controller. Your authentication will be verified in the typical process, you know, as if you were attaching to a domain. There's a couple of concerns here. If it's not over an encrypted link, that NTLM hash can be captured and can be brute forced. This is the older, I think it's NTLM v2 or v something. And it's a, uh, and in addition, if you're in a wireless network or you're suffering from man-in-the-middle attacks, and you can masquerade as that domain server, in many cases, you'll be able to hijack the authentication and spoof any user you want. That's something you should also realize, uh, IIS usernames and passwords, sorry, IIS usernames are stored in the registry, and, no, let me get all that and also the so-called virtual directory permissions as well. Within each IIS virtual directory, you have any number of security restrictions. You can allow read access based on certain users. I'm sorry, based on whether or not someone is logged in or is administrative access. You can allow write access, which we generally don't recommend. You can allow execute access. 
you can allow things such as the, down, the running of uh, ASP pages or so-called server-side scripting. You can require the use of SSL. You can require the use of SSL certificates. We recommend that you restrict this as much as possible and keep in mind when coming up with these restrictions that this native CE security is not as good as a traditional desktop. So again, don't assume that something's going to be secure. Don't, don't allow write access and assume that, well, I'm going to, I'll lock down the file permissions and therefore they won't be able to write to it because they will. As I've said this before, but I think it's worth reiterating, if someone can gain access through some other server to the underlying CE operating system, all of your security protections provided by IIS goes away. SNMP for CE. I, I've had, when I was doing penetration testing, uh, whenever we found SNMP, we always knew this was going to be an easy job. SNMP is a very insecure protocol. It operates over UDP. It, in CE, it's typically the same as virtually anything else. You have, by default, a public read-only secure community string. You have the option of having a management community string. You can actually have several community strings. By default, there's only one. If you are going to use it, turn on authentication traps and make sure as soon as you start seeing uh, so-called bad logins, you react to it quickly. In addition, there's a registry setting called permitted managers, and that's going to restrict who can access right, perform right operations on the SNMP MIB to certain IP addresses. Of course, we all know SNMP operates over the user datagram protocol, and excuse me, because of that, you can spoof any source IP address that you want. So if someone knows the right access password, the right access community string, and also knows what the value of that register key is, it's, the security is going to be non-existent. You'll be able to spoof yourself right past it. SQL Server for CE. Forget everything you know about SQL Server. Uh, the CE variant is entirely different. There's only two ways to read or write the data there on board. You have data replication. And typically, that's replication between a CE device and a master database on some server somewhere. You also have remote da data access. And that's essentially allowing ASP pages to do updates to the database through some kind of web front end. Of course, who here has, uh, has hacked a computer using SQL injection before? Hopefully, legitimately, through some kind of a penetration test. I'm not going to ask you all that, that though. SQL injection is just as much of an issue on CE in this type of a configuration than any other operating system. It's one of those vulnerabilities that's just universal. And most of the people that are writing code for CE uh, generally don't take it into account, even though they should. In addition, because of everything I've already said, if you're implementing this kind of solution, kind of a solution on CE, Think about what kind of data you're storing. Think about what would happen if that data got out, because chances are the device will be hacked at some point. And just frankly, if it's something like temperature data for a metropolitan area, it's probably safe. If you're a hospital and you're storing patient information, you're probably safe on a client or personal device such as a PDA, but avoid doing that with CE on any kind of a server. FTP daemon and Telnet D. These were two of the first daemons ever, ever written on the internet or ever conceived of. They were written back in the early 1980s before anyone knew what information security was, and they're still around today and they haven't changed all that much. We recommend that you never enable any of these de devices or any of these servers on your CE device. They're turned off by default in almost every default configuration, uh, I think except one or two. Things to realize, FTP has similar authentication uses a lot of the same registry settings for usernames and passwords that IIS does. There's no ability to do encryption, and there's very limited uh, write access for the anonymous user. So you might log in as the anonymous user, but he's going to have roughly the same access as your average user on the system. He's going to be able to write to any file that a normal user could write to. He's going to be able to read any file that a normal user could read from. You can, on FTP, do so-called CH routing which means you restrict the access of FTP users to a specific directory and directories below that. Um, we have not succeeded in finding a way to break out of that change routing, but we haven't invested a lot of time as of yet either, so 
there's a good chance that that portion of it is insecure. In the case of Telnet D, there's less security than FTP. There's no possibility of encryption. You have the same authentication scheme. There is no concept of CH rooting. Uh, if you, unfortunately, there's no SSH server for Windows CE, so there's no alternative if you want a remote console. Uh, that being said, if you really do need to gain console access to your CE device, we recommend that you force people to physically walk to the device or to physically uh, hand the device over. Allowing telnet access is just too risky. It's going to cause too many uh, problems, meaning too many incidents. So wrapping up this section, if you remember one thing from this presentation, remember this. Microsoft has absolved itself from the requirement of providing security for CE, although they have been responsible to certain vulnerabilities that we've reported. What they've done is they've said, look, we're going to provide a minimal set of functionality to these OEM vendors, and it's now the, their responsibility to correctly build and implement secure features. That could change in the future, but at the moment, that's the way it is. Unfortunately, uh, many of the OEM vendors today, including some companies with strong security requirements, have essentially uh, not risen to the challenge. A lot of people are shipping insecure versions of CE, frankly, because you can't blame them. They frankly don't have the internal resources to do the job. So it's, uh, it, it's kind of round robin in terms of who's responsible. You know, they, they tell Microsoft to build it. Microsoft says we can't build it for everybody. It's a custom problem. It's, uh, that's actually why Mobile Secure exists. In addition, because of the limited nature of what Microsoft provides, it's impossible for you to take just what they give you and build something out of the box that's going to be secure. You're going to have to add your own operating system components. You're going to have to write your own code. And again, a lot of the OEMs don't want to do that. Moving into the next section, we're going to take a look at, not from the OEM perspective, but from a user perspective, what you can do with a typical version of CE to make it more secure. And in this case, we're looking at Pocket PC 2002 and 2003. This is, again, uh, most of you probably raise your hands, probably have one here. What you do to harden these kinds of devices depends to a certain extent, but not a great extent, on where you bought it from. The security provided by Compaq, for example, is probably a little bit better than the rest. Most of the others are probably the same. Getting down to the details, the primary recommendation, don't ever run active sync or don't ever synchronize your device with your desktop over the internet. We've already discussed the reasons why. I won't go into it again. For Pocket PC 2002, you want to disable the automatic receives of beamed documents. You do that by clicking on the Start menu. Then you go into Settings, Connections, and the Beam option. There's one simple checkbox. It's the easiest thing you'll ever do. It'll probably do the most to enhance the security of your device. Use a VPN whenever possible. All Pocket PC versions ship with a copy of the Microsoft PPTP client. Unfortunately, most ISPs don't provide uh, PPTP servers, but you can, you can get secure remote clients from Checkpoint for CE. There's a whole slew of different VPNs available. In addition to your system password or your system PIN, if you have a smartphone device or a Pocket PC phone edition, you're going to want to go into Start, Settings, under the Personal Options, click on Phone, and set this PIN on your personal cellular telephone hardware. That's going to prevent those things that I discussed earlier, gentlemen turning on the microphone or making certain calls, et cetera, et cetera. Because of the flash attacks that I also discussed, you're going to want to make regular backups. Many versions of Pocket PC ship with their own custom backup software. You can just insert it into the cradle. You click here, click there. It'll do a complete backup. Also, you can back up to the flash memory, but we don't recommend that you do that because it can be that particular data could be molested while on the system. We recommend that you back up to a separate processor or a separate device. If you don't have one on your system by default, you can typically purchase some backup software for about $10. If you haven't already, how many people here don't have a system access password on their pocket PC device? Just one. That's good. How many of you are lying? <laughs> Somebody's honest. 
Of course, I uh, have a system password on mine, although we have a lot of test devices. This one does not have a system password on it. You want to, you want to enable this system password, and you want to be cognizant of the limitations of what CE provides by default in this area. You, you get there by clicking on Start Settings Password. It's really easily accessible. And by default, the password will only be activated after 60 minutes of inactivity or one hour. Well, that's really bad because let's say you lose your CE device, someone else picks it up. You know, if that device has been suspended for 45 minutes, it's very likely someone's going to find it before an hour is up. All your, you know, your, your password isn't activated. He's going to look at it. He's going to be able to do whatever he wants. He's going to be able to, you know, send all the data off to his own internet site or mail, you know, connect to his mail server and mail himself everything that's on there. You should cut that time limit down to at least five minutes. And personally, we do recommend that you find some security software that will allow you to um, create, have an improved password scheme. MobileGuard isn't the only software that does that, uh, but I believe it's the only intrusion prevention software that also provides this functionality. And essentially, we'll make sure that, one, the password is enabled as soon as the device becomes uh, suspended or turned off. And second, any type attempt to brute force the password is going to be frustrated by an increasingly long timeout period. And there are ways to, you, know, you won't lock yourself out of the device after three bad login attempts, but it'll, the, the login delay will scale up and up and up and then decay back down such that anyone trying to brute force into the machine won't be able to get in. Realize that your system password is stored in the registry. It's a hashed value. You, you can't expect too much better. They have to put the password information there somewhere. The hash algorithm is not itself public, but it is known to some people. And of course, there is always a risk there of dictionary attacks. PPP passwords, on the other hand, are stored in the registry generally as plain text, in my experience. If you're going to store this type of authentication information, realize that if someone gains access to your device, he could then have uh, information on which to get into your ISP account. And moving on to the next section, for those of you who were late, uh, if, you, if you want to, feel free to move up a couple of rows towards the front. I'm going to be using Visual Studio and running a sample exploit and doing some disassembly on the screen here. And it's going to be a lot easier for you to read and see what's going on if you're not in the back row. How many people here have used Embedded Visual C? Very nice. Embedded Visual C is just like Visual Studio, but except that it's built by the Windows CE team and it's a customized version that's designed to allow developers to write code specifically for pocket PC and smartphone type devices. At Mobile Secure Research, sorry, Mobile Secure Labs, we've discovered a number of serious vulnerabilities in pocket PC and CE in general, and we are working with the Microsoft Secure Response Center to get these vulnerabilities remediated, meaning get patches available to customers, and then to publicize and allow, give people the information and advisories on them. Unfortunately, uh, while Microsoft has been very responsive to the vulnerabilities, several, a number of the OEM customers have not. And unfortunately, even though we've begun reporting to the Microsoft these issues about four months or so ago, none of the vulnerabilities as of yet have remediation or patches available. In keeping with responsible disclosure, uh, Mobile Secure has decided not to release any real vulnerability information in this presentation. We've taken a specific vulnerability that exists in Pocket PC and emulated it here in this program. And what we'll do is show you the exploitation of a standard buffer overflow and how it would be done on this type of operating system. In addition, this particular egg code here that is written in ARM or Acorn Risk Machine Assembly, which is the processor that runs on virtually 90% of other CE devices out there, the purpose of this egg code is going to create a system call or call into a, a system call that will cause the device to reboot. Other things that could be done would be to zero out all the memory or to reset the device. In addition, things, any, any function call that you want to call could be called. For the purposes of this, we wanted to keep it simple because of time considerations. It's going to be very difficult for those of you in the back to actually see the device itself reboot. If you're interested in seeing another demo of this exploit up close and personal, 
I'll be happy to do it again after the talk is over. You're welcome to come on up behind the podium and uh, you'll be able to see it in detail. So what I'm going to do is first tell you a little bit about how this exploit works. We have our overflow data here and this begins, this is going to get called into a vulnerable function. Now typically this data would be sent over the network or it will be inputted via some argument by a malicious attacker or inputted through some environment variable. We just put it in the program itself here today so that it was that much easier to demonstrate. Call func is our vulnerable function and we have a 10 byte character buffer and everybody knows that stir copy is an insecure function and allows for uh, smashing of the stack. Obviously this argument that we pull in here is a lot more than 10 bytes long. I'll go over here, it's got all kinds of stuff in it. Most of which is assembly code. So in the beginning, we have some data that the, the eggshell uses. We have this 0101013C. That is the hardware adaption layer reboot code. It's an IOCTL code that tells the kernel that when I make a kernel IO control call with this value as the first parameter, what we should do is reboot the kernel. In fact, the real value is 0101003C, but that would have put a zero or null value in our shell code, which would have caused the stir copy to not work. So what we do is we keep this here. We load it into our first argument using this instruction. And then later, we turn off that one bit that we had set in the second octet of the word using an XOR, or exclusive OR operation. On x86, for those of you who code x86 assembly, the exclusive OR operation is XOR. On ARM, they changed it, they call it EOR. You say tomato, we say tomato, what can I say? The second word of, our, of this particular eggshell is F001FE74. This is the entry point for the kernel IO control system call. One thing to realize under ARM, in that not only is the CE kernel uh, much less protected, but the ARM processor itself uh, does not have the notion necessarily, it has a notion of a system processing mode, but it, it doesn't keep it quite as separate as say an x86 or a Spark processor. If you're making a system call on the x86 processor, can anyone tell me what instruction you use? Right, it's in probably an int 21 or an int 2e. Within the ARM processor, there's no concept of an interrupt to make a system call. You're simply jumping into a specific memory location within kernel address space from user mode. The kernel will detect this, trap on it, and reset the, the processor state to system. In this case, we also have a null value. It's FO, we were looking at FO00, and so we load R5 with our entry point here, and then later on we do another exclusive OR and we set that one bit back to zero, as we should. After our data section, we have our overwritten stack pointer, which we're gonna use our stack pointer to then access back into this particular area of memory. That's 2006 FD4C. And we have our overwritten program counter value, which is going to point into the next one octet of this location that I have highlighted. And that's 2006FE68. After that, we have our instructions, and I'll go through those real quick. First, we zero out registries one, two, and three. And why we're doing that is we're making a kernel IO control call with the value of the HAL reboot code, and then all zeros. When you're calling a function in ARM, arguments one through four are mapped to registers zero, one, two, and three respectively. Any additional arguments are going to be placed on the stack directly above the stack pointer. And so therefore, when the function enters, it's going to then copy its, it's going to use its frame pointer and copy its next arguments after argument four, copy it to its own stack frame, use them, and return back. And the way we set those next two arguments is by taking, I'm sorry, So we've set SP to the value of 
the beginning of this area of memory, minus 104. We could set it to minus 100, but that would have created a null byte in the shell code, so you just use 104 and 108 respectively instead. We then load these into register zero, which is again that HAL reboot code, and then we load our entry point into R5, which at the end we'll put in the program counter to actually make our jump. We then zero out our last two arguments by using our stack pointer to put the contents of R3, which we've already set to zero, into stack pointer plus four and stack pointer plus eight. Again, we should be putting it into stack pointer plus zero and stack pointer plus four, but we're doing this to avoid any type of null value or string terminator in our code. After we do that, we increment our stack pointer by four, and therefore we fix up all of our address offsets and we're good to go. Does anyone have any questions about the structure of this exploit before I begin? All right then. We're compiling this, and you'll, you'll notice right here, we're configured to push it out to this default pocket PC device here. It's being sent over an active sync connection to the device. And now I'm going to press F5 and begin debugging this particular process. I've got my fingers crossed. This, I had a couple misfires testing this out last night, but I eventually worked out the kinks. So let's hope that uh, we don't run into any problems today. Okay, we have a couple of windows open here. And we're now running this process, not on this laptop here, we're running this process on this little PDA right here. And again, if anyone wants to see this up close and personal, please do come up after the end of the talk. We're about to call into our vulnerable function here and load in our bad evil shell code. I'm gonna press F5 and go to the next breakpoint. And now we're in our vulnerable function. Let me see if I can get this. Now, can someone tell me what this little window here is? Anyone? This is what's called the stack frame of the program. Does everyone here, does everyone here know what this is? Just raise your hand if you do. Okay, wow. Basically, this stack frame is tracking what function is called what other function. So we have what's called the WinMain CRT startup, which in fact called WinMain, which is down here. And WinMain then went and called our vulnerable function. The way that stack buffer overflows in the stack work is by overwriting this buffer here, this a buff, and overwriting the so-called return address within the stack. And once we overwrite the return address, it's going to over, that address right now is pointing to this win main area, okay? So that when it returns, rather than returning to win main, it's going to return to our shell code. If you guys, if there's anyone who doesn't, isn't with me, please raise your hand. Everyone's with me? Good. So what we're gonna do is, we're just gonna skip past the debug, past these three instructions here. This is loading some arguments, it's gonna you know, set some stuff up. It's gonna call stir copy, right, which corresponds to our, our C code right above. And that's going to overwrite all this data here and it's gonna overwrite our stack frame. I'm gonna hit F5 and move down to this instruction here. Ah, good, it worked. So everybody saw the, what changed up here? Everybody sees that this is different. It's not WinMain anymore, is it? It's now pointing to 2006FE68. And wouldn't you know it, if we go down here, there's our 2006FE68. Now what's gonna happen is we're gonna 
push back up our stack frame, then we're going to return from our value. When we do return, we're not going to go back to win main. We're going to go into our shell code. And I'll do that now. Here goes nothing. And there we are. You'll notice this sub R1, sub R2, sub R3, and then the setting of the PC. It hopefully it looks familiar if you've been uh, watching the presentation. This is the exact same instruction code that I went through earlier before running this program. So we'll just step through it step by step. You'll notice registers here. Here's the R0 register. Here's R1, and so on and so forth. Right now we have a new stack pointer and a new program counter. And you'll notice that R1 now becomes red when we change its value. R2 is already equal to zero, so nothing happens there. We'll reset R3. We're going to load our HAL reboot code into R0. It'll show up there, right around here. We're now going to load our system call entry point into R5. We're going to set our, we're going to turn off the one bit in our HAL code so that it's now the correct value. This one's really boring. We're just going to set up our stack frame for the last two arguments. We're going to set up our SP so it points to those two zero values. There's the SP going to get changed. We're going to set now, set off that one bit in our system call entry point. Now, can anyone tell me what this last instruction is going to do? Who said it's going to reboot the device? Whoever said that was right. Maybe I said that, but we'll just... When I, print, when I click next here, if those of you in the front will look, this thing will get rebooted. It helps if I move the pointer over here to... And there it goes. The intent here was to demonstrate what's possible using buffer overflows on Pocket PC and Windows CE in general. All of the traditional types of vulnerabilities that you think of that, that exist on traditional Windows operating systems also exist for the Pocket PC. How many of you are familiar with something called Windows.net? People say Windows.net is going to solve buffer overflows. People have heard that. To a certain extent, that's true. Uh, things are going to happen, and it will on CE as well. It's going to happen a little bit more slowly because CE uses less of what's called managed code on its devices than a traditional Windows operating system. So hopefully these kinds of problems will go away. We won't have to worry about them anymore. But for the time being, it's, it's still going to be a significant issue. So this is basically, we're approaching the end of the presentation here. If any of you have thought of any questions while I was talking, going through any of the sections, I would love to hear them. Hopefully, I've, uh, I've tried to cover as much as I can, but hopefully I haven't covered everything. I'm sure some of you might have something you'd like to ask. So please, sir. That is generally, that is generally the same for each pocket PC device. Oh, sorry. I apologize. The question was, what is the, what is the uniqueness of that system call entry point? So that F0, et cetera, et cetera, 74, is that for this device only? Or is that for every pocket PC device? Or is that for every Windows CE device? And generally, it's going to be the same for all the pocket PCs. I can't tell you off the top of my head about the rest of CE. But it is 
there's a range defined within the Acorn Risk Machine processor that says roughly 2,000 and some such to 2,000 in FFF and 4Fs is dedicated to system call entry points. And that's, that's hard coded into virtually any pocket PC you pick up. Did everyone understand the answer? Great. Yes. Yeah, and if you, if anybody wants to uh, get a copy of this, feel free to send me an email. And this is all stuff. Huh? My email address is here on the presentation, and we can talk about getting you a copy. Any other questions? Sir. The question was, what method did we use to find buffer overflows? It was mostly binary analysis and fuzzing of specific applications. So we're not using any techniques that aren't, haven't already been done, or we're not reinventing the wheel there. Essentially, it's the same kind of problem, and you, you find it in the same kind of way. Did everyone understand the answer? Sir? The question was, is having the Windows CE source available made any difference in terms of the security research? And what he means by that question is that part of the CE source code to the kernel is shipped with the Microsoft Platform Builder, which is what Mobile Secure uses to do a lot of its security testing, and also what the OEMs use to build Windows CE. The answer is that it has had somewhat of an impact, but not as much as you would think. Um, the source code that gets shipped is all centered around allowing OEMs to port Windows CE to their particular hardware specs. So it's things like making sure that you can write your own device drivers. It's things like making sure your kernel is optimized, your, your processing context switching is optimized for your particular processor, your particular memory architecture, et cetera. It's not things like exposing the source code to Internet Explorer. Microsoft has not opened that up to the OEM customers. So therefore, those types of vulnerabilities, typically you're working with the same kind of, uh, the same environment that you would be in a traditional Windows environment. I'd rather not say it was significant. It's, I would say less than 10. Any other questions? How useful is that considering the fault of the security? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? How useful is that considering Microsoft's default to the OEMs for such a The question was how useful is working with Microsoft to resolve these security vulnerabilities when they've defaulted, when they've defaulted to the OEM? And the answer is that it's actually quite useful because. While Microsoft hasn't, has kind of passed the ultimate responsibility to the OEM, when we do contact them, they do recognize, in each case, they recognize the vulnerability. They've been able to reproduce it, and they've been working on a patch. Um, it's useful in the long run. In the short run, what happens is the customer suffers because even after the problem's been solved, to, I don't want to single out a particular OEM, the end consumer doesn't get access to that patch until it could be months, maybe even more than a year after it's been reported. And in fact, some users will benefit more so than others. One OEM might ship it, and half the OE other OEMs might not. And then there's a dilemma in Mobile Secure, do you go ahead and publicize the vulnerability? And we haven't figured that out yet as to what our threshold is, because you're always going to have a couple of OEMs that don't, you know, don't want to do anything or they've end of life the product and there's just no way to fix it at that point. Any other questions about Windows CE security or anything that I've said here in the presentation today? Sir, again. 
Not at this time. I believe the market's there. Uh, is the market is the volume there today for a secure shell for Windows CE? I don't know. The market is clearly there for the secure shell client for CE, and that's provided. However, I would like to see I would like to see SSH provide that software, frankly, because it's there are people who do need it, and if there are if they've already ported the client. What's I'm sorry. Yeah, I had checked their website just as recently as last night. The question, of course, was, is SSH server available for CE? And I couldn't find it. The comment was, the gentleman believes somewhere out there there's an SSH server for CE. And that's, although I don't believe there's a commercially supported version at this time, uh, there, it's on all likelihood there is an open source version available for CE. And that's a very good comment. So in, in fact, many of you could probably port your own copy of SSH server for CE if you really needed it. That's a very good thought. Any further questions or comments? Does so anyone here use CE in their job as part of their work? Sir, in the back. Can you repeat the question, please? The question was, of the exploits identified, are they, are they pocket PC specific or also applicable to the smartphone as well? The answer is roughly half, I think a, a slightly more than half, have been, have been applicable to both. Does anyone have any recommendations on additions to the presentation for next year? Anything else you'd like to see further along? Or anything else you'd like to hear more about if you were to go to the presentation again? Got my fingers crossed. Yes, Ryan. Not necessarily. The question was, what binary analysis tools are available for Windows CE? And the linchpin to that question is that IDA Pro works beautifully on Windows CE binaries. And you want to make sure that you're within any kind of licensing agreements that, you're, that are being enforced upon you when using IDA Pro. But clearly, IDA Pro will cut through any Windows CE kernel binary, kernel DLL. It will cut through any Windows CE application. And I believe there's a, a talk at DEF CON for those of you who are attending where someone will demonstrate that. Uh, clearly, it's something that we do in Mobile Secure Labs uh, within, the, within what we're allowed to do based on licensing agreements all the time. And it's, it's very easy to disassemble these things, figure out what they're doing. In many cases, the ARM processor, the instruction set is a lot easier to comprehend and understand quickly as to what the behavior of a particular application is and especially where a particular potential for buffer overflow is. Well, you know, it's a lot easier to see if they're checking the length of a string versus on the x86. They, the question was, will IDA Pro break out all the system calls and what's being called? The answer is yes and no. All system calls are run through something called core DLL.dll, which is the core system uh, entry point for Windows CE function calls. 
And IDA Pro will then look at the function offsets within that DLL library. So it will say they're calling wsprintf, which is actually a libc function. It will also say it's calling create file or open file. I, Could you repeat the comment? Yes. Exactly. The comment was this gentleman has written a piece of code to take a function offset that's being called within a Windows CE binary and get the actual real name. And essentially, if you, you do IDA Pro on a binary that, and it doesn't have a copy of Core DLL, it will simply say this binary is calling Core DLL function number 987 and it doesn't tell you what that is. IDA, if it's supplied with a copy of Core DLL, will actually go ahead and, and do that itself and, and put in the function name. Also, in addition, there's, with Visual Studio, a program called Dumpin, which does something similar and will print out a list of all the function names and their, uh, their offsets. And I, I assume you've written one that does something similar along those lines. Could you give us the URL? Okay, datawarm.net. I'll have to take a look at it. Thank you. Any other questions? Last chance, folks. Well, I'd, I'd love to keep taking questions, but no one's asking, and also we're starting to hit about the, the 1.5 hour time limit. I would love it if, uh, if anyone has any further comments, you know, feel free to approach me. Uh, come on up to the podium. Be happy to talk one-on-one. -on -one. I'd love to get a chance to show this demonstration exploit up close and, you know, or uh, discuss any aspect of Windows CE security that you'd like to discuss. Well, we're not supposed to plug corporate products at Black Hat, but since you asked, I, I didn't. At, he's, I don't even know this man. Mobile Guard is a host-based intrusion prevention system and system integrity system for Windows CE. So it will it resides on the device itself, and can, if you're an enterprise customer, communicate with a central console for things like policy pushing and central logging and reporting. It will essentially monitor the activity and behavior of the device to make sure that any attack coming in is prevented or blocked, and that any suspicious and or either suspicious activity or blatantly evil activity that's occurring within the device by some process that's managed to somehow get on and, and start running is either one, blocked, or two, is logged and hopefully automatically remediated, or it can be dealt with by a person who knows what they're doing. Uh, there are some other uh, features that are limited to certain corporate customers that I prefer that I could talk to you one on one, but that's the main gist of the product. In addition, there's a lot of, there's encryption capabilities, there's the system password, which is improved and prevents things like brute forcing. There is uh, user, certain user controls for companies who want to restrict what their employees can do with a particular device. There are certain ways to reconfigure the device remotely there is also some other features. I'm drawing a little bit of a blank. It's, I haven't, uh, I've been, haven't been working on the engineering side of things in the last little while. Do you have any questions about, mobile, about the product in general?
Well, I thank you everyone for attending. Again, feel free to come on up after the now that the presentation is over. And I hope you've enjoyed the talk. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay here in Las Vegas and uh, at Black Hat conferences.